Right. We are live. Greetings, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Dark Das Africa Renaissance channel. I have with me Baruti and Namdi, and I'm your host, Ego. Hello, gentlemen. How are you Hello. doing? Hello, everybody. Hello. Great to see you. And to all our new subscribers, we've got quite a few in the past two weeks. Welcome. Welcome to the dark. Uh, thank you for, for visiting. We hope you stay. And please take a look at all our previous shows. And we hope to keep providing you with um, excellent content, analysis, and objective uh, perspectives on things that uh, affect our continent. So without further ado, let's get into it. The topic for today is Africa and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Now, this is a subject that um, uh, has been seldom talked about, but has been talked about more recently, um, especially in international uh, arenas such as uh, Davos, which is going on right now. Uh, I think they spoke about it a few years ago, about 2016. There was a, little, there was a tiny mention in the conference there, Davos. But in general, um, leaders are not putting this at the forefront of their agendas. Um, but it's coming anyway. And it's something we thought we need to look into. And uh, we hope to break down uh, the different aspects of this, uh, definitions and uh, criteria. And uh, yeah, please chime in with your, co your comments, questions, and interact as much as you can. Send it to friends, uh, uh, forward, share and um, like, subscribe at the end. So uh, to start things off, uh, we just wanted to frame the whole um, subject matter, and we thought we would start from this. So, all right, uh, went to the back. OK, so <clears throat> perhaps you gentlemen will help me, because I don't have um, uh, since I'm projecting, I wouldn't have all my uh, all my computer to uh, access, but we can generally get the whole conversation going anyway. So to start things off, since we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution, uh, some people would want to know, uh, for those who wouldn't, what is the industrial revolution itself? Um, so we'll just have a discussion around that before we break down, and I'll go through how we're going to frame the discussion. So we're going to go through what is the industrial revolution, and from there, we will talk about what is the what are the second and third ones leading up to the fourth, and then we'll find out what the fourth industrial revolution is. Um, then we're going to um, discuss a little bit about AI, artificial intelligence, and then uh, we're going to discuss the current state of infrastructure on the continent of Africa and how it's able to support such uh, advancement. There going to go into what is leapfrogging and leapfrogging is, is a term or phrase that has been used to suggest that Africa does not have to uh, or has an advantage of going beyond uh, uh, Western countries due to a already lack of infrastructure that they have and not building a step backwards and jumping into the next phase we'll go into that and then uh, what is 5G? I know a lot of you have heard about 5G since it's, it's, it's coming soon. Uh, and from there, we'll just talk about what the pros and cons of artificial intelligence is and Internet of Things. Uh, impact it's going to have on jobs in Africa if and when adopted. Uh, and how, how we can compete globally. And then at the end, we're going to find out if we uh, think we should adopt, delay, or abort um, the fourth industrial revolution altogether. So with saying that, I will now end my slide, and then we'll get into it. <coughs> Stop screen. So <coughs> I'll just start with the first one. Um, definition, obviously, the industrial revolution it was the first revolution. Um, that's when. Europe uh, transition to new manufacturing processes, um, you know, like the printing press using steam engines uh, for the textile industries, you know, with the cotton industry uh, that was uh, uh, facilitated by slavery and colonialism. 
Um, so that was the first industrial revolution. Um, the second uh, industrial revolution was a period uh, where there were advances in steel production, electricity, and petroleum. Uh, and this changed society uh, quite drastically with construction, railroad building, and, and machines were also built during this period, a lot of uh, heavy duty machines. Um, and then the third industrial revolution, that was um, more about uh, transforming energy, uh, the economy, communication systems, smartphones, um, uh, and the like, and automation as well. And now when we get into the fourth industrial revolution um, and how that is defined. Um, I'll get a definition of the fourth industrial revolution. As we said, it to take center stage. Uh, the concept was coined by someone called Klaus Schwab. He's the founder and executive chairman of a Geneva-based uh, company. And he coined the term fourth industrial revolution simply put refers to how technologies like artificial intelligence autonomous vehicles and internet of things are merging with human and physical lives uh things like uh, voice assisted uh, voice activated assistance facial id recognition digital health health sensors uh um, um, um uh, remote automation uh remote surge surgery uh, merging uh, um, healthcare tech um, with, with with your body, um, delivering healthcare over vast distances with no lagging, so uh, self-driving vehicles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, with saying that, uh, I'd love like you two gentlemen wanted to chime in, and uh, what what are your thoughts about in general the the introduction and and how well, this? Of course, well, that, that was a fine breakdown. I, I just. Um... I just want to go back to to something you mentioned, just so I can um, kind of link these uh, these types of industrial revolutions. So, in general, and then kind of both of you kind of correct me as you know if I'm uh, missing something. But ego, this is just uh, since you gave the introduction, I want to uh, ask about the connectedness. Okay, so. In this first industrial revolution, you pointed out that uh, you dealt with many uh, manufacturing processes, uh, many of them uh, predicated on the types of um, items that were produced by African slaves. So I guess we could put in cotton, sugar, uh, tobacco. These would be products that you know would have um, had uh, refinement, right? But I think the steam engine that you mentioned was certainly a, a later um, process that was manufactured. So as I watched um, a video, it, it kind of summarized some of that, talking about the factories <clears throat> dealing with textiles. Okay, so you gave that about the manufacturing processes, and that's what I got out of that. Now, when you uh, went to the second one and you start mentioning, you know, there were new industries um, and you gave uh, various inventions like the light bulb, you know, that have been created. There was a word that stuck out to me, not necessarily in what you in what you said, but just in some reading I had done about mass production. OK, so. In the production of light bulbs and in the production of other kinds of things, is that is that the link or the transition to get from the first industrial revolution to the second that you had um, manufacturing processes in the first, but it was a mass production of items um, that linked the first and the second? Is that, is that the main thing, the mass production? Yes. So okay. more like the expansion of the first. Okay, the expansion of the first. Yeah. Okay, so what in your mind, or in both of your, your minds, what is the link between the second and the third, given that we know some of the inventions uh, that you may have mentioned in the third industrial revolution, uh, semiconductors, uh, PC, the internet, 
what is what exactly is the the link between the second and third? How do we transition? I mean, you're not able to go. I, th I think it's it's largely um, telecommunication systems. Uh, but if not, now nobody wants to say something here. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. What? 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 Well, I mean, what? What makes the third different than the second, other than new, new, new technologies? Is it just the newness of the technologies, or is it the more rapid pace uh, un under which uh, things are expanding from the basis of light bulbs and telephones. Uh, ele electricity, I think, um, was was what characterized largely the second one, and then obviously the expansion of that into the third with telecommunication systems, uh, um, internet itself as well was part of that. So there was, there was um, a, sh a shrinking of the world uh, at that stage due to technology expansion. Okay, so so microwaves, I imagine as well, or microwaves, um, uh -huh. uh, magnetic, um, you know, um, ra radiology and radiography. Those those, those things were also um, expanding uh -huh. in, the third, in the third industrial revolution. So, so what you're telling me is, is that once electricity. Uh, came into being as a practical way to um, even uh, mass produce <laughs> items that had been the first industrial revolution. It became the applications onto electricity that basically represented the third. Is that right? No, I, th I think that was uh, more the second. And then the third was largely characterized by telecommunication and the internet. Well, but aren't those applications uh okay, so oh I see. So 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 it's really the the telecommunications and the internet that characterize the third industrial revolution as opposed to just applications of electricity itself. Are you talking about the second? Well, the second uh mass production um industries involving you know electricity of course yes, yes but in the third one if you have the pc and the internet um wh what is the what is the link or the transition between the second and the third is it applications of the electricity or just simply the, the formulation of telecommunications because <laughs> i would oh, think I telecommunications would be an application of electricity. Um, well, okay, I'll say um, then there's a an economic transformation as well at, at that stage okay. uh, due to uh, improvement in in in, um, in, uh, in, in electricity um, globalization. I think followed suit around that around that time. A renewable electricity as well, okay. um, and I think more of a manipulation of energy. Uh, I think nuclear energy as well came around around that that period. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, it was more the transformation and the the manipulation of, of energies um, and communication systems and a rapid more uh, improvement in economies. I think that that's what characterized the third okay. industrial revolution. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. So so now we've got the the idea of the first, second, and third. So now. Uh, the fourth, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. I gave uh, a definition about a uh, person, Klaus Schwab, who who uh, coined the term. Um, but this 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 is one that's just coming into. I mean, it's been slowly gathering pace, but we are we are on the brink of of, of this uh, fourth industrial revolution, especially in the in, in the West, in the US, and Europe, and Asia. Uh, I think Asia's at the forefront. I think they've already uh, begun the fourth industrial revolution. Um, artificial intelligence is firmly embedded in um, in places like uh, like China, Shenzhen, uh, and other parts of Asia. Uh, more so, they already have uh, things like five G, which we'll get into. But um, it, it's it's something that's gathering pace. Um, there are a lot of fears. Uh, there are a lot of um, a lot of apprehension as to. 
to the fact that probably uh, it's moving too fast, uh, legislation is not keeping up, or society is not keeping up uh, with the changes that are to come. Uh, questions will be asked about uh, ethical issues um, that have not yet posed themselves. So there, there are a lot of lot of things that uh, are still even difficult for advanced uh, economies to grasp and deal with. Mm -hmm. and, um, but in this context, we're talking about Africa here. So um, just defining the fourth industrial revolution, I just wanted to know if, um, first of all, there were any any points you generally wanted to raise or highlight before we go into uh, the next point, which is about what is AI. But about the fourth industrial revolution, was there anything uh, you wanted to uh, raise or mention? I do, but Namdi, if you have something, please please start first if you like. Not really. Let's move on. Well, I I had I had one, and that was um, there have been some you know debates about what the difference was between the third and fourth, and some observations have been that one that the fourth uh revolution is a like a, a massive speed up in development technological development from the third that's one and and also in the fourth it's an emphasis on the interface between human lives and technology that everything is integrating how technology is used in our everyday life with examples, Ego, that you had already given, like uh, autonomous cars. But I also want to point out, you know, stuff like um, being able to uh, like have a hip replacement that was um, created from like a, a 3D you know, 3D printed bone and things like that. Or, you know, how you can um, wear certain um, implants, you know, that might uh, tell people how your blood pressure is doing, things like that. But it seems also to be characterized by this interface between human beings and the use of technology. Yes. Exactly. The, um, yeah. The force industrial revolution is just characterized by fusion. I think. Barito summarized it perfectly. It's characterized, it's characterized by fusion of digital, biological, and physical worlds, uh, where artificial intelligence, like Igor mentioned, um, cloud computing, robotics, nanotechnology, advancements in biotechnology, 3D printing, yeah, and um, Internet of Things, you know, the interconnectivity of different devices, and obviously advanced wireless technology. Um, I mean, we are beginning to see the emergence of such um, different parts of the world. So the fourth industrial revolution essentially means uh, an, an increase or, a, or an acceleration of this new and emerging technology, um, which is definitely going to lead to transformative changes, not just um, around the world, but in, in, in Africa in particular. And, and here's the thing. So, so uh, as we just mentioned, some of the uses um tech, some of them are, are, are used for for uh, healthcare management some are used in homes for for uh, logistical purposes uh shopping voice activated voice assistance uh for sh for scheduling uh for booking things for planning for organizing um to help with cars uh, um, um, automation travel transport uh, um, when it comes to healthcare and delivery, like surgeries, people would be able to uh, s perform surgeries uh, remotely. Uh, and the key key points or key component is during using um, uh, or th th this industrial revolution would allow you to be able to to have a, a very low latency. I think is what it's called, low latency uh, lag when it comes to five G, which we're getting to. So therefore, you'd be able to manipulate. Um, remotely, uh, robotic arms that can perform surgeries across oceans. Um, and that's just one of the things it can do. There's a, a 3D printing as well that, that could come online. 
um, and then numerous numerous other applications that, that it could be used for. So it's going to be a complete change and revolution as to what we know now. Um, it can bring, uh, or it, it can drastically reduce uh, dependency or, or, or the need for for physical jobs um, because automation will be possible. We're talking about farms being run, tractors or, or, or processing plants all being run uh, remotely uh, without any human insight. Uh, production will completely change and be transformed, uh, which will have an impact on, on jobs and lives and the purposes of people. Um, healthcare will be improved, so people will be living uh, longer. Uh, right now, the, the life expectancy on the continent of Africa is somewhere between 50 and 60 years old. Um, so as they're growing into middle class and uh, with likely adoption of some of these um, uh, um, technologies, that would increase. Uh, over here in the West, uh, it's, it's currently over the 70s, and that would further increase as well. Um, so, so we're talking about a, a true, real revolution in the world, more than we've ever seen before, probably just as significant as it was in, even in the first revolution, first industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's quite significant, just to buttress um, that point. But uh, I'll, I'll stop sharing now, so I come back to... Okay, so now that we get um, what the whole point or essence of the fourth industrial revolution is. Um, now, I think we need to go into the nitty gritty, which is what is AI, which is artificial intelligence. Um, fourth industrial revolution obviously has different components. There's AI, there's 5G, and some of these terms people may not understand, we'll have to break them down slightly. We won't go too much into it, but AI is artificial intelligence. Um, and artificial intelligence uh, is basically computers being able to um, learn on their own and to be able to uh, control other computers. So uh, it's, it's, it's deep learning uh, or called machine learning uh, where the actual reliance on human input would now be uh, diminished. Uh, we see this in, um, uh, I think, the first time when they, they programmed a computer to, to play chess with a human being and beats a chess master, a grandmaster of chess. Um, I think that some some years ago, a couple of decades ago, this was the first time I think it was a quite significant uh, display that uh, artificial intelligence was coming or becoming quite powerful. Um, there have been many a science fiction movie and novel about uh, artificial intelligence, things like Terminator has talked about, you know, how one day uh, AI will become so intelligent and powerful and and take over the human race, but that, that's just um, uh, films and, and movie. But artificial intelligence does have its um, its usage and it has been employed uh, further and further in society, um, in, in, in many aspects of our lives, our daily lives, and it's not abasing anytime soon. Now, uh, our focus is Africa. So, um, on the current infrastructure now on the continent, uh, do we think that artificial intelligence is proliferating, not proliferating as it should be uh, at this stage? Um, what What do you think the current state of infrastructure is when it comes to artificial intelligence? Well, um, I think I think I think the current state of infrastructure is still in its infancy, it's still early days. Um, it's, but it's beginning to, you know, beginning to get a pace, but it's still very much in its infancy. Um, we know that countries like South Africa are positioning themselves to become leaders of this new area of technology, like artificial intelligence. I think this was this was one of the, the bases for South Africa hosting the um, the World Economic Forum in two thousand and. Um, uh, 2016, I believe, um, where the, the president there, Cyril Ramaphosa, told business leaders there in Cape Town that um, the country stands ready to embrace this new age um, as a solution to address, you know, the challenges as you know, face, South Africa is facing, such as uh, you know, high inequality and grinding unemployment. Um, but um, we don't really know how that will 
that would pan out in, in, in terms of practical terms. Um, one thing is for sure, um, the measures of AI definitely will have uh, a significant um, impact on the, um, not just the economies of South Africa, but the African continent alone. We're looking at um, um, the creation of at least well over, according to how some analysts project to be, to be about 3 million jobs across the African continent by 2025. Um, so there's a risk amongst different African countries at the moment to position themselves as, as uh, leaders in this new area of technology. Like I mentioned earlier on, South Africa is definitely positioning itself. We have Nigeria, we have Ghana, we have um, Kenya. Kenya in particular has one of the most advanced um, um, internet um, penetration across the uh, <coughs> I, believe, I believe that Kenya, as a matter of fact, has over 90% internet coverage in the country. And um, in the last couple of years has been attracting quite a significant amount of um, uh, tech companies that are definitely um, components to this new, uh, this fourth industrial revolution. So, um, but there are there are challenges associated with this. There are challenges, and then maybe we can talk about that as we as we pro, as we proceed um, um, into the um, as we proceed as, as we produce as we proceed deeper into the show. But um, yeah, but at the moment, in terms of where we stand for artificial intelligence and the countries that are that are leading the way, we have a few countries that are beginning to emerge. Obviously, South Africa. We have Nigeria. We have um, Kenya. Um, Ghana, uh, Mauritius, um, but it's still in its infancy. Countries like the United States and China, are well, uh, well, are well advanced when it comes to artificial intelligence. And then I, I think I read a book um, last year by a, a fam uh, by a former chief executive of um, Google called Kai Fun Lee, and he wrote a book about the AI superpowers. And uh, let me just see if I can just share my screen let's see, quickly. Um, so he wrote a book about AI superpowers. Essentially, talked about the um, the race between the United States and um, and China in the race of for, for, for artificial intelligence. And um, see, I don't know if you guys can see my screen. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the book there. The AI superpowers, China, China, the Chinese Silicon Valley and the New World Order. So Kai Fun Li um, was a former Silicon Valley executive who worked both as an executive in you know, the top, top US um, firm, I believe that's either Google or thereabouts, and equally worked in tech industry as well in China. And he just talked about, he gave insights about the artificial intelligence, about this, it's early starts in, in London in particular. Um, I think Igor mentioned earlier on about companies like DeepMind that had played mm -hmm. a, a crucial role in the development of artificial intelligence and how they, they began to test run it with um, um, with chess. I think Gary Gary Kasparov. I think there was this famous, Kasparov, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was this famous Russian chess player who they were initially trying to test out this artificial intelligence with and. Um, and they were subjecting it to different kinds of tests. I think there's a major test that they subject artificial intelligence applications or solutions to called Turing tests, which is essentially a test that, that essentially tries to, they try to make sure that the, um, so if an, if, a, if an application or a solution is able to pass um, or evade detection from the, the, the Turing test, then, the, 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 then their application has been able to demonstrate that it is on you. You will be un, unable to detect if the application is actually an AI solution or actually being human. So to interest one. So the early stages of AI, in particular, started in England, but um, we found out that um, from the from 2010 in particular, the Chinese seem to have picked picked up AI as a subject matter, and they ran along with it. China, as you know, has a deep culture of uh, mimicking and copying things from other countries. So they. Um, you know, they still technology, um, especially technology from the West. So the AI was definitely something that they uh, they definitely picked up on quite late in particular because AI research in AI started even as early as the early 2000s. But the Chinese seem to have picked to pick it up, and um, between 2010 to about 2017, 18, they are seeing that research in AI for Chinese technology seems to have even eclipsed that of the United States. 
Um, so right now, China is world leader when it comes to AI, artificial intelligence. A matter of fact, they are beginning to deploy it in different spheres of their life. There are about three ports. So this is the first of its kind in the world. There are three major sea ports right now in China that are strictly run by, that are strictly, um, fully automated. Okay, they use artificial, artificial intelligence and applications, so they don't have any single human present there at the seaport. From when the, 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 the ships dock at the ports to when the, the, the cargoes are lifted from the ship, placed in there. And um, also, we begin to see the emergence of um, different artificial intelligence applications springing up and being integrated with the, um, the overall. Um, uh, um cyber security architecture that china has such as uh, um, the uh, surveillance cameras to facial detections and other kinds of more advanced software so china is really positioned china has positioned itself if you even if you look at artificial intelligence research if you look at it research in artificial intelligence or patents that are beginning to come up you see find that chinese companies and even chinese scientists has um, even eclipsed that of the United States. And then um, we begin to see even Chinese companies like Tencent and uh, artificial intelligence companies like Tencent and Baidu playing a leading role in artificial intelligence um, um, new technologies. So currently at the stands, the race between uh, who's, which country will dominate the, this, this particular new this area of technology is being run by the Chinese. And I think there was a publication that came out in the Brooklyn, uh, by the, published by the Brooklyn Institute that essentially stipulated that um, the countries that will, the country that will dominate uh, artificial intelligence by 2030 will rule the world until 2100. So this is like a new Cold War we're seeing now. There's no, um, um, unveiling in our, you know, right before our very eyes. And countries like the United States and China are in a race for a country that would dominate this new area of technology. And so far, the Chinese appears to, they, they, they may have been late comers in the game, but it, it appears they, they, they have caught up with the United States and even overtaken the United States in this area. So why we in Africa were focusing on trying to, you know, get ourselves up to scrap this new level of technology the race as it stands now for artificial intelligence, clearly in the United States and China. If, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing my screen, I just wanted to show the viewers this um, report um, you mentioned. Uh, and you, you can go ahead, but what, you, what you're going to be watching is basically the port that Natalie mentioned, which is um, um, fully run by artificial intelligence with no uh, human in sight. Uh, th this is the port. So you see the vehicles are just moving around and the machines are loading and uh, uh, unloading containers, but they're, they are unmanned. And this is just one of the ports they have like this. So just to, just to show and, and, and to exemplify what we're talking about, how they are, they have been fully integrated and fully uh, immersed in developing AI technology. Um, but sorry, go ahead, Bruce. You were about to say something. Well, I guess I have a, a, a question that maybe maybe both of you gentlemen can kind of deal with. Would you say it's kind of a two-parter, but maybe you can answer the first one, then I can proceed with the next one. Would you say, what would you say would be the average uh, level of unemployment right now in most African countries? Um, well, it depends on the country. Somewhere like um, like uh, Tanzania, I, I don't imagine it would be that high. Rwanda, I don't imagine it would be that high. Nigeria would be very high. Um, in fact, a number of them in West Africa would be quite high, if not the highest. Uh, with like Central Africa. Um, so give me a, say, give me a I don't know. Um, area. Why, uh, 40, 40%, 40% unemployment. Yeah. I, I think, I think, I think the unemployment rates on the continent overall is definitely very high. Double digits. Well yep. into the, uh, well into the, um, 
40s, 30s, 40s on the, on the average. I'm looking at it holistically. Okay. Um, then. But All right. Promising. Let's, let's start with that premise. Let's go with let's go with some double digits as you said into the um, you know 30 percent, even 40 uh, percent. Okay, so if the unemployment level is so high now, a why why is it such a problem to train workers now? to do conventional jobs prior to AI? That's the first question. And in the second question, if AI will obviously um, make various jobs obsolete, will AI create more jobs than it made obsolete? Those are the two questions I have. First one is, why is it so difficult to train workers for current jobs in Africa, obviously leading to so much un unemployment, either there are no jobs or people aren't trained for the jobs that could be available. And two, as AI is more phased in, will AI create more jobs than it made obsolete? Okay, if I, can, if I can just go answer that one quickly. So okay. AI definitely will create more new jobs. Uh, we're looking at, like I mentioned earlier, we're looking at at least 3 million jobs. AI has the potential to create at least up to 3 million jobs in Africa by 2025. But that will be subject to uh, the level of skills. So what we are seeing on the continent now, we're seeing countries, like those countries that I mentioned earlier, on play a, a, a crucial role in upskilling their population, so training their, their population in this new era of technology but unfortunately africa has been you know a bystander in uh, you know in a previous industrial revolution and hasn't really been involved in terms of taking that leadership role in this new and emerging technology so that explains the reason why even right now that you know the continent is still at the at the, at the very you know, the early stages of the fourth industrial revolution, we've still have not even, you know, fully embraced or adopted the, uh, the the benefits of even the third industrial revolution. So we're going through a phase where we're even trying to, you know, understand, you know, the components of the previous industrial revolution, and we are already now moving into the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, so um there are definitely going to be downsides to it we're looking about job losses especially in the area of um the area of uh, white uh, blue collar jobs so jobs that involves like uh, customer service uh you know i, I give you an example of seaports uh and you know other 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 jobs that are not mentally men, mental that doesn't involve a huge level of mental task that doesn't involve a high level of mental task. So you see artificial intelligence begin to replace those level of jobs. So we, we could see, especially from, from now, 2020 to about 2030, we could see a significant rise in unemployment. But that doesn't mean that um, new areas, new job areas are not, are not, are not emerging. It just means that we are moving into another phase, another, like you call it, another industrial revolution. We're moving into another phase where new sets of jobs uh, are going to are going to begin to emerge, and old jobs are now going to become obsolete as machines and applications like artificial intelligence begin to take over those jobs. Because what artificial intelligence does essentially is to mimic human functions and replace it. In terms of the economic impact, we're looking about. Um, I think the 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 uh, the World Bank estimates that um, artificial intelligence has the potential to create between about $15.7 trillion into the global economy. And $6.6 .6 trillion out of this $15 trillion will be down to increased productivity. So you can see that even with the adoption and introduction of artificial intelligence, it's definitely going to have an impact on productivity as a whole. Again, I'll give you an example of um, the seaport in, in China. So you can imagine now that seaport essentially is now to, runs 24 hours because it doesn't actually need humans. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to deal with pensions. It doesn't have to do with wages and all that. It just has robots just operating. So you can imagine 
the impact it could have on the Chinese economy and other countries that will be adopting this model of technology as we move deeper and the job losses associated with that. So we're going to be dealing with people who will be suffering significant job losses on the African continent, rising unemployment rates, but at the same time we'll be seeing a creation of new jobs, especially in this area of technology, not just artificial intelligence, but other components of the fourth industrial revolution. So nanotechnology, biotechnology, internet of, internet of things, and other uh, components of the, uh, uh, okay. the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, um, but, but before you continue, I, I, just want, I just want us to get, just get some concepts down uh, before we get uh, further into those. Uh, 5G, you mentioned 5G and the inter internet of things. Um, that's just for those who don't know, it's just the, um, again, the third industrial revolution was uh, an advancement in, te in, techn in communication technology systems and the internet. Now 4G, oh, sorry, 5G um, would be an expansion of 4G, which is now the interconnectivity between appliances and, uh, and humans as well. So that would be autonomous driving, logistics, uh, um, delivery systems, healthcare. Um, things in, uh, connecting and, and, and speaking to each other in, in essence, uh, which could be your fridge freezer with your microwave, with your light bulb, with your watch whilst you're at work, with your car, and everything is all linked up together. There's a complete uh, synchronicity with uh, appliances and technology uh, over vast uh, spaces and, and distances and, and, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and applications as well. So <clears throat> But I wanted us to uh, not to miss this point because I think it's quite important, which is leapfrogging. Um, th this this now is um, uh, basically what has been cited as Africa's um, advantage, which is the infrastructure that they had was never uh, was never fully uh, after colonialism was never fully established. There's a lot of infrastructure that wasn't there, especially uh, when it comes to things like um, uh, telephone lines. So we never had telephone lines or technology or able to even fully get into the third industrial revolution um, but but that was a disadvantage at the time which now has become a sort of advantage because now they're not building everyone went straight to mobile um, smartphones and because they went to smartphones they never built um, landlines so now we're moving to fiber optic uh, cables they're going straight to internet uh, there's 4G on the continent, and now we'll be able to move to 5G much quicker and much more efficiently than it, it would have to do in the West. In the West, they, they all built their systems around uh, the 3G and just upgraded to 4G. So to get to 5G, we saw what happened with the UK and US where Huawei uh, was brought in to try to come and create 5G um, uh, systems and um, framework. But for fears that China would be spying, they, they cut that deal. So now it's been put on hold. So 5G uh, systems takes uh, in the West is going to take a lot more because they have to break down and cause massive interruption to their already existing systems before they're able to transition it for a lot, a lot more expense into 5G. But with Africa, we don't have that problem. They can go straight to 5G or straight to 4G, which is what they're doing now, and then go straight to 5G because the infrastructure wasn't there to begin with. So that's what leapfrogging is. So, um, so the, an advantage, I, I wanted us to discuss that before we go into the things with job and everything else. But um, yes, go ahead, Bruce. So, okay, so, okay, so in your mind, does, a, does the emergence of AI in Africa represent a type of leapfrogging because a lot of current technological jobs that are seen as commonplace in so-called Western industrialized countries haven't been maximized in Africa because of infrastructure. So therefore, if it's not maximized at all and people are not working in massive form in conventional technological uh, jobs, then AI would just mean you could just simply train people for jobs of the future without having to re retrain those people who would normally have been displaced or dismantle old infrastructure 
to, to put in new, we just simply in Africa for a large part of the time, simply putting in new infrastructure because commonplace infrastructure as thought of in Western countries isn't really there. Yes, absolutely. Um, that, that idea coupled with the fact that there's a, the largest population of young people are on the African continent. Um, so all, they, all that would need to happen would be for them to be, uh, for the educational system to now shift its, its, its direction in retraining for the future. So the workforce is there, uh, changing, uh, changing and tweaking the educational system will now put them firmly in the driving seat to be able to meet the expectations of this new era that is to come. Um, in uh, being able to create a uh, technology that's suited to the African continent, their needs and requirements. Uh, but it takes a, 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 re, a re, reskilling, refocused educational system, which is uh, right now it's largely a colonial system. The jobs and the training and the education is geared to serving Western uh, uh, industry and Western companies um, largely. Um, and not to resolving the issues that are on the ground. So there's not a lot of um, uh, analytical, uh, uh, skilled kind of jobs that are required to creating the the infrastructure and industries that we need on the continent. Sort of, it's sort of a bit a bit of that is, is is happening now, but the educational system is not geared for that yet. So um, it's a decision as to how they're going to be able to meet that. At the same time, not just train the youth to go and work for Western companies who would, are going to take longer to adopt uh, 5G and these AI systems. So we can adopt it quicker with, uh, with, the, with the relationship that Africa has with China already and be able to get that synergy going, uh, reskill, re retrain our youth so they'll be at the forefront and become the experts before the West does, before the United States does, before Europe does. I think that's an advantage that we can use and further leapfrog again. Um, so well, there are two steps I think we can do, but we have to be careful um, not, to, not to do it and just become new servants of either China or the West when they get up and running. We have to leapfrog and then become custodians. So we will now even be able to be ahead of the West when they eventually come uh, come to be uh, fully fully uh, um, com converted into five uh, G infrastructure. Okay, let, let me let me ask you a few 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 questions here. Okay, um, so so let's say we're we're going from four G to five G. Is is going from four G to five G? simply a speed increase in interconnectivity between, as you said, humans and their appliances. Is, it, is that simply a speed level increase? Um, the speed is, is a large factor in it, but I, I, I think from what I understand, it's not just speed. It's, um, it's, it's speed, it's, it's low latency, what, what, is that? Uh, what is low latency? Basically, basically, it's like, uh, you know, when you're connected, um, I guess there's a lag sometimes, you know, when you're like downloading, when, when you download uh, a movie, you know, some downloads, depending on the size of it, uh, it's like if it's like five gigabytes, it might take, I don't know, 10 minutes if you're using like 3G and some 4G. But we're talking now when you're downloading um, files and data, it mm -hmm. takes seconds, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes milliseconds for large pieces of data. So literally, you can now have, um, like the conversation we're having now, there will never be a lag whatsoever. Right now, there's a lag between the conversation we're having from it appearing on the actual channel that people see, you know, but when you have 5G, there will be no lag. It will literally be instant, which will now allow you to be able to have things like holograms and have conversations with people live as if they were there. The amount of detail uh, you'd be able to get it, it with things uh, when it comes to uh, uh, pixelation and quality of, um, of, uh, of, of visuals and audio, um, um, 
in the inter in, 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 interaction of, of, um, of virtual reality and augmented reality, those things will be able to be utilized to its fullest potential. Okay. Um, so, so, so there are there are a lot more changes and upgrades to, from 5G to 4G. It's just okay. the most drastic. So, 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 from what you're saying, to go between these transitioning Gs, 3G to 4G, 4G to 5G, we're really talking about the combining of speed data quantity and efficiency that escalation and all those three combined together gives you a new um ability to to interconnect quickly efficiently and with um great clarity in real time yeah and, and over, over a lot um over uh, further distances as well you know, you're gonna have, you know, logistically there are advantages to that. You know, you could um, you could program things to, and, and it's now also embedded with um, machine learning and and, uh, and 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 things like that. So you can see that port that was literally just operating on its own with no with no one there. You know, that is is an autonomous driving as well, where cars will be able to, to detect other cars. Uh, to be able to get you from A to B, to be able to prevent accidents, uh, to be able to run at a speed, to know the speed limit, the, the amount of information that's accessible um, everywhere at every time to every device and appliance is 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 fast. Okay. Yeah. Now, now, uh, thanks for that. Now, you mentioned that. Um, well, well, when I kind of gave my idea. And you kind of agree with this that in many African countries, because of the lack of current um, current infrastructure productivity, and working, that more immediately to uh, AI will in fact be beneficial because you have less. Um, less infrastructure that had to be dismantled um, and you could do direct retraining of workers in the new AI type setup. Now, based upon your saying that, do you think that in African countries, for the most part, it would actually be cheaper for many African countries to uh, sort of position themselves Along the AI track, because since the infrastructure in some cases is lacking right now, you no longer have to um, discard or dismantle infrastructure, except to build new infrastructure uh, that was not replacing infrastructure that had to be discarded. So, is that an economic benefit for the continent as well as part of this leapfrogging idea? It should be a benefit, but then um, it's it would be a hard sell to some people because um, how would you justify knowing that you don't have the skilled workforce currently to to justify such an expense? It's like building, you know, an ice rink for for people who can't skate. You know, it's it's hard to sell that to um, you know a, a country's parliament. Who are trying to, you know, um, provide, you know, uh, you know, subsistence for for its population, a population that that, that largely doesn't have jobs, aren't skilled, um, and 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 are hungry. You know, it, it's hard to sell that. So it, it needs radical, radical um, some solutions. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying here is, what I'm saying here is, is that. Even these so-called Western industrialized countries would not they have to train a workforce in new AI-based? Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. They all they all have to. Therefore, African countries would have to train people in AI-based jobs. Also, unless you're saying that European countries 
and some Asian countries have advantages now by having masses of people working in the industrial sector now. Is it, in other words, is the conventional industrial sector in industrialized countries now better as a as a as a foundation to move into AI, or can you just basically train people to get into AI without using the intermediary step of the current technological uh, infrastructure that's that's in place now in the in the Western countries. I I, I don't I don't think um, you'd even be able to have a choice. I mean, first of all, we we'll have to think about it as business, and, and in business, you want the lowest um, expense for your business to grow. Lowest expense being if you hire real people, real people, you have to pay them salaries to do jobs that robots can do. And that's what Internet of Things allows you to do. You can now do a lot more um, without hiring a single person. So regardless of if Western countries have people who have an intermediary skill in their industry now, mm -hmm. the owners of those industries, the leaders of those industries, will will eventually, sooner rather than later, want to move into um, using 5G te technologies as soon as they can, because there are a lot of cost savings for them there. Mm -hmm. um, their, their competition would be doing that. In Asia, they're already doing that. So they don't want to be hiring people. They'd rather um, have people, have uh, robots do it autonomously and not have to hire people, pay their pensions, pay their health care and all that, all that kind of stuff. That's where they'd want to go. So, oh. I, I, so I, I, I don't think Europe or the West is at, a, at an advantage because of where they are right now. If anything, they are at a disadvantage because they're further, they're fully embedded in that system and they're not going to be, there's not going to be any increase in job creation in, in the actual skills, the skill sets they have right now. Okay, so, so what, okay, so give me some examples then. Okay, so if you're, if you're, okay, so from what I, let's say I'm listening to what you're saying and let's say, what what I hear or think I hear here is that you're telling me that let's just pick any kind of um, let's just pick any kind of industry. G give me give me a give me a current industry right now uh, that's very technological. Just give me one. Agriculture. Okay, so. Let's um let's just say we have the technology and agriculture of people driving tractors to you know to uh, help cultivate uh, you know farmland uh, you know you have uh, some farms partly run by 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 solar power you've got people working as technicians on various types of um, agro machinery, right? To run a modern commercial farm. All right. Now, so we've got, let's say, a modern commercial farm or an industry that is using modern uh, farming technology, agro machinery. So in hearing what you're saying in application, then if we move into AI more fully, with all of the things you're showing now, let's say that no one is driving them. But today, for the most part, we've got, you know, machines being driven by humans. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. So let's say I'm listening to what you're saying, and then I see that, okay, we've got, uh, we're moving into AI in the farming industry, in the agricultural industry. So the big, the big companies in this industry, when they move into AI, they feel like they want to create less physical jobs for human beings because they, with machines that are autonomous in some cases, will allow them to do the current work, but only done without humans. 
So therefore, they don't have to pay additional staff. They can actually cut staff. All right. So if AI, in many cases, depending upon how it's done, will actually reduce conventional jobs. In this case, for example, with the with the agriculture on a conventional farm, then what types of jobs do you think will be created by AI that will be done even in the agricultural setup if AI, in fact, is reducing current jobs done technologically or not? What types of skills and what types of actual jobs will be created for humans to do in AI. If we put a programming, for them to program these tractors, the GPS systems, um, um, programming uh, the machines, um, still the research would require humans to research into the seeds and the, the biotech aspect of it. They'll still need humans there, uh, those scientists. Um, and then jobs and I guess finance, uh, uh, surrounding those uh, finance and, and, all, and obviously um, repair. You still need to repair some of those machinery, so the engineers as well still be required. So those are the jobs that we need to um, to be created around that, especially in the West here, which is what I think they're, they've already been transitioning to. Um, but, the, but 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 then you know they have a shrinking population, and we have a growing population. Um, so we have to be pretty, pretty aggressive with with trying to to upskill a large amount of, of, of young people, a large amount of people, period, to be able to meet meet the demands of, of that population. <clears throat> We're talking about before the end of the, of the century, <clears throat> four billion people. That's that's a quadrupling size right now. Uh, somewhere like Nigeria is going to have about 700 million, um, probably just over 2050. So, so it, it, it's going to be pretty drastic. Um, okay. Require a, a, a lot of um, a lot, a lot of changes to happen, and it happens very, very quickly. And this is the argument that people are having, saying, should we? Is the question with the pros and cons? Should we transition now or not? Is it worth transitioning now, given the hindrances to uh, the education system right now? The amount of young people we have right now, as it stands, mm -hmm. of ages between 18 and, and, and 30, is, is, is it too soon? Should we just skip that part and for this generation, focus on providing them with the old 3G, 4G jobs that they can do now? And then, uh, when they build up capacity, move on to these more modern jobs. This is the argument that some people have on the question. Now, 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 what do you think about that? I think I think we should be very strategic. I don't think we should just jump in um, head on. We are not driving this new technology. We are not driving it. Okay, we are not driving it in any way. We are largely consumers of this new technology. Any new trend that is coming out now, we in Africa will just literally consume it. We are not driving it, so we are not leaders in this new trend. China has been able to catch up. You know, I mean, it's just it's, it's just it's just sheer sheer determination for the fact that China um, has been able to just catch up with, with the U.S. in the area of artificial intelligence, and they've been able to do this within within ten years, literally. You know, I mean, to to overtake a country or a civilization that, have, that has pioneered. The fourth industrial revolution, the components of the fourth industrial revolution, and artificial intelligence within within ten years. I think that's 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 phenomenal. But I think one of the reasons why China has been able, was, able, was able to do this is because um, the drive uh, to overtake the U.S. in this new area is not just five G, but artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and all those other new components of the fourth industrial revolution was the the fact that the governments of China actually you know played a crucial role in backing. Uh, of these new areas, so, but in Africa, I don't know. At the mo I don't know if if we'll be able to catch up yet because at the moment, from what I gather, only one point one percent of the budget in most African countries is being allocated to this new area of technology. You know, the continent has a lot of challenges. 
So, but for this kind of new era of technology, you need more than one, more than one, one point one percent uh, allocated in in in, um, in in your budget to be able to drive this new area of technology and to enable us catch up. I, 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 I say one point one percent in in science and tech budget exactly. so or, or education. Exactly, science and technology, for example, in most African countries, gets you know very very the budget that most African countries allocate for science and technology is very very low. So that's 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 one indicator, you know. So, but but obviously China uh, allocates you know a lot of money, you know, provide funding for for AI research, provide funding for biotech. Even a lot of the pharmaceutical companies now, a lot of the research that a lot of pharmaceutical companies do now, a lot of the research now comes from China. So you know, so this China has been you know pumping a lot of money in this area and investing a lot in in research. And this one area that the United States has really struggled in. Because obviously the U.S. spent a lot of money in his um, adventures overseas. Uh, over seven hundred billion has been spent on on defense alone that that could have been plowed into the into the U.S. economy to actually compete effectively with China. So, but um, China obviously, obviously has taken a, a, a leadership role in this area. So, but we see, but, but back in Africa, there is you know we could catch up. But uh, especially in the area of leapfrogging, but I don't know how that's going to be possible, considering the fact that the budgets, um, there are a lot of African countries that allocate to, you know, to this area, to this new form of technology, seem very relatively very low, and there are there are challenges associated with it. I mean, um, take AI, take um, AI for example. Um, we've seen a, a rise in. Um, 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 Cyber security related crimes on the African continent. Mm -hmm. um, um, banks are being uh, banks are being um, banks are being attacked by um, hackers from different parts of the world. I mean, there was there was a report about three years ago about some North North Korean. I don't know how true that is, but there's some North Korean hackers who hacked into uh, a South African bank, and we've been seeing a, a rise in you know all this. You know, cyber-related crimes. And a lot of African countries do not have the infrastructure required to combat this new uh, and emerging threat. Um, like I mentioned earlier, different African countries are at different phases of their development. Some countries still have very low internet penetration rates. Some of them are even as low as twenty to thirty percent, like Niger, countries like Niger, while some have as high as um, eighty to ninety percent, like Kenya. You know, but on the average, I think internet penetration on the African continent see who was around forty percent. Um, so although it's been steadily rising, I mean about five years ago, penetration on the on the continent or holistically was about thirty-five to thirty-five to thirty percent, so it's still very low. So we could see for twenty twenty, I think it's about forty percent now, and there are projections that by between twenty twenty five and twenty twenty thirty. Internet penetration on the African continent could rise to as much as 65 to 70 percent. So in the next 10 years, as you can see, and internet penetration is definitely crucial to enable us to compete effectively in this fourth industrial revolution. You know, how can we compete when we don't have uh, a wide coverage of internet penetration? Although, like I mentioned, some countries, different countries are at different rate when it comes to this, and different countries are actually beginning to prioritize and begin to look at how they can upskill and train their 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 citizens and to to enable them to compete effectively, so I think we should adopt a more skeptical approach to this on how we uh, on how we embrace it, and um, um, you know to be a bit to be skeptical on, on how we embrace it and um, begin to you know approach it a bit more strategically. Uh, okay, I, I got I got uh, three so questions. One, 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 one second, uh, Nambi, uh, there's a question for you. But first of all, could you also st um, could you uh, uh, share uh, my my image on screen, okay. and, um, and I read a question. And you come back to you, Bruce, But there's a question from Carl. It says, "Ask uh, since the will to surpass the USA motivates uh, motivates. Since the will to surpass USA motivates China, uh, do you think instilling patriotism and pan Africanism in our people's minds can motivate us to innovate?" Yes, I, I think I think it can. I mean, it just it just sheer determination and and funding because. For example, a lot of the people who have the skills in this area, uh, in this new emerging area um, on the African country, are largely in the diaspora. So the African, the African diaspora, who are you know essentially the residents in the United States or, or in other parts of Europe, you see have you know like I said, I mentioned earlier, you see have programs that are coming up 
in, in different African countries that are even offering scholarship for training in machine learning, in deep learning, in uh, you know advancement in biotechnology, nanotechnology, uh, um, Python, or other form of new software, programming software that are, are crucial to this um, industrial revolution, but are still largely in, in its infancy. You know, so um, but can we can we leapfrog? Can we compete effectively? Yes, I mean we can we can leapfrog the infrastructure. I mean we talk about five G. A lot, a lot, a number of African countries are already ready to roll out five G, and I understand that even in the US they're still trying to upgrade some of the infrastructure. Even as even in some in some Western European countries they don't still have the infrastructure required to even roll out five G successfully. But because most African countries are really, really um, virgin territory. So you can have an African country that can literally leapfrog from using 2G, 2G, 2G technology to 5G technology, you know, because the infrastructure is still very much in its, in a, uh, uh, very, very much virgin. So can we do it? Yes, we, we can. But I'm, 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 I'm more concerned about us taking the lead, just the way we see China now taking the lead in 5G. And it's making the U.S. very uncomfortable. We see China, Chinese companies like Huawei, actually now playing, becoming world leaders in the area of 5G. And even I, I even understand that China is even working on 6G. You know, things like this make the West very uncomfortable because China has not just only caught up with the West, but China is now overtaking the West in the area of technology. So that's what I want to see us do in Africa. So I want to see us compete effectively and, and overtake not just consumers of this new area of technology, which is which is what we've been in the, in the last, you know, industrial revolution. We've just been largely consumers. We just literally consume. We buy the books of all these of, of of authors who've written several books on programming or different areas of the industrial revolution, and we read it, we digest it, and we teach it to our kids. But I don't want us to be just consumers. I want us to be pioneers, people who drive who drive these changes, and people who will be people who actually determine the future part of this fourth industrial revolution. So that's that's the area. And I want us, that's the role I would want us to play, not just you know spectators in this in this new in this new race. Okay, oh, go ahead, Bertie. Can I can I buzz in with a couple of questions? Yep, yep, go ahead. Okay, okay, I want you all to try to, and even if you can write write some of these down these questions down, I, I want you all to just tackle these these three. I'll try to make them. Succinct. Okay, so ego. Earlier, you were saying that primarily the kind of jobs that AI in mass will create is in the areas of programming, finance, you know, high high tech, high tech repair. Um, so if this is the case in terms of what the AI will, will demand in terms of new jobs, would this first of all require that if you became kind of AI centric, that most people will have to be college educated basically in order to be employed? That's the first question. Will most people have to be college educated in order to um, maintain or participate in an AI-centric. Hello, Bruce, I think your audio is gone. Um, but but let, let, let's go one, one, one question after, after the other. Uh, I think it'll make it easier. So the first question, do people have to be college educated to be AI-centric or to be able to um, manipulate the technologies? No, I don't think so. Um, even right now, I think it pops up on my screen all the time. You have all these um, all these websites and applications, uh, things like Fiverr and uh, uh, um, Udemy, and many courses you do. And, and the, the the structure of education has changed now. That there are courses that teach these things like Python, coding, and other uh, IT centered um, 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 training that's pro provided over the internet. Um, people can can have these trainings uh, remotely and, and can be can be uh, 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 can be skilled in them once they get trained and then they can get, gain employment. Uh, but first, they don't have to be college educated because 
you're you're getting training for a specific uh, a specific task, a specific course to do a specific thing, not like university or college where you'd go and you get like a range, a variety of, of skills and things you learn, which you may or may not ever use in your life. So um, nowadays you don't need to do that. University is now becoming, uh, it, or the university is going to change in the next uh, half century. Um, a lot of people will just be, will just be getting trained for specific duty. In fact, some companies now are looking to start their own training kind of um, uh, colleges. Um, I've heard of the big multinationals are trying to get people straight from from high school and train them in order to get jobs in their companies. They're no longer going to universities. So the university might not be here uh, much longer in the traditional sense uh, in, in, in the next 50 years. I, I agree. I agree with Igor. I think, I think even a, a lot of these tech companies, because the technology definitely is going to be the driving force for this change in, 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 uh, in the coming years. A lot of these companies, tech companies that are beginning to emerge now, uh, are not even putting emphasis on degrees any longer. Because so you think it won't be about degrees, but it'll be about technical certifications? Yes. Okay, all right. That's that first one. Now, the second one is, okay, so let's just say that African countries didn't get so caught up in the AI race, but saw that if they pull back to invest more in infrastructure, conventional infrastructure that we know now, that sort of um, balance 3G and 4G jobs, that you would have a situation where you could possibly employ more people conventionally and at the same time have a balance for a uh, for a pretty technically developed country even though you weren't out racing and outpacing those countries that immediately saw that they need to do an AI race would, 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 that, would that be a compromise that could be kind of an equilibrium balance for African countries to have more people employed conventionally and to have basic modern technology without a super rate to get to an AI structure. So I, I didn't quite get that question again. Could you, could you repeat it, please? Okay. Can you still hear me clearly? Yes, yes. Now I can. Go ahead. Okay. So if African countries overall basically concentrated on upgrading current infrastructure to handle 3G and 4G type jobs being con conventionally done by masses of the citizenry, which would mean more employment conventionally right now, would that be enough balanced with a basic technological economy to provide Africa to be in a good position for kind of an equilibrium. More people working, but also a pretty decent modern uh, technological infrastructure as opposed to being so AI-centric that you in fact displace so many people without the ability right now to um, completely transform the society into an AI-centric environment, given all that would have would, would have to be done to do that. So, so if, 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 if I could try to crystallize what, what, what you said, are you saying um, is there a way that? Uh, African governments can utilize the current existing infrastructure right now to create jobs for uh, its populace as it stands now, using the existing platforms of, of 4G and 3G. Uh, yes, with the idea that that 
if they upgraded the current infrastructure, more people could be working right now and we still would have a balance to have pretty decent modern technological environment even if we're not trying to outrace other countries that are trying to be AI centric. Uh, okay, I think I think that can happen, but that that takes a, a political standpoint, which means, say, like in this in the instance of uh, the EFCTA, and we shut off from the rest of the world, then yes, we can be able we can we can manage with what we have right now and trade with ourselves and uh, provide enough um, uh, work for our own people. Mm -hmm. But if we remain in the global sphere and in the global uh, marketplace, mm -hmm. then you have to compete with the global marketplace. And you can't compete with the global marketplace when you take a knife to a gunfight. You, you have to upgrade if you're going to be with them uh, when they're that advanced uh, in their systems, as opposed to yours, so and, and and that's my and that's my fear exactly. And I think ego is right. And that's my fear, you know. Um, although in some areas we've demonstrated that we can leapfrog. I mean, we're looking at um, advanced payment system like in Pesa um, uh, that we see in Kenya. Um, you don't even have that kind of technology even in the West, mm -hmm. or we have uh, even more sophisticated payment systems that we have in Nigeria in InterSwitch. These are indigenous mm -hmm. homegrown technology that we developed by Africans and maintained by Africans. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have demonstrated in some cases that we can mm -hmm. leapfrog and develop technologies that are that even way advanced. I mean, there is this even in the recent um, UK African summit, there was this um, uh, uh, a Nigerian lady who developed this um, um, internet-based blood bank national system that um, she got she got funding from from uh, um, Jack Ma in China to deploy not just um, within within Nigeria but across across West Africa. So in some areas we, we've demonstrated that, but there are equally fears that uh, you know that we could also be at risk of being swallowed up by what I would call um, surveillance capitalist com companies like 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 Google, like Facebook, that are very skewed, skilled in the act of. Um, Capturing data of 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 its of its um, of its users, manipulating them, and sending them over to to third party organizations. I mean, this is essentially how you know companies like Facebook um, um, and 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 Google make money. And I think a lot of people have forgotten even that that, that Google um, used to work um, or used to work in, col in collaboration with um, U.S. Um, um, intelligence organizations like 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 the CIA. And then they, they do share intelligence with these organizations. And, and obviously, we, we see that even Alphabet, that's the, the parent, company of, parent company of Google, is now a, a multi trillion dollar organization. So we can see an expansion. And this is my part of my theory. We can begin to now see an expansion of all those companies into the African continent as the, as the population continues to rise. Um, where they can now begin to set up shop, like the way Google has set up now. Google has set up like a artificial intelligence research area in Accra, Ghana, where they are now beginning to mine data and capture data, understand. So these are kind of, kind of the steps that this, again, I I, 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 use, I call them surveillance capitalists uh, take in trying to mine data of an organization. Like, is this essentially how they make money? Because a lot of people don't understand how all these new tech companies make money. It's not just about advertising and placing an ad, ad, ad adverts. They actually catch capture um, data of their of their of their users. Um, they have sophisticated algorithm. They have um, uh, subliminal programs within their, uh, their, their 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 software interfaces that essentially you know understands human behavior, understands human patterns that they go on to now sell. To you know, third-party organizations that essentially you know they, they, they observe your moves, they, they, they look at your goings. I don't know if sometimes when you go and search for an information on Google, I don't know if you guys have experienced it. When you go, sometimes the Google then prompts you as if it knows what you are searching for, or you you you're trying to procure something on Amazon, and Amazon has an idea of what you have procured previously, and is now making suggestions 
So they are kind of predictive algorithm, the predictive software, <coughs> kind of information that all these large tech companies are now capturing and now selling. So we may begin to see an expansion of these companies into the African countries. And I may be, I may be wary about that, com, com, uh, cons, uh, considering the fact that they have the economic might, the economic muscle to do that. And if that happens, then this will begin to do, we will now begin to see a repeat of what we saw in the second and third industrial revolution, where we essentially show an expansion of um, Western multinational companies on the African continent, who essentially went in there and just mined resources of, of the continent without, you know, um, any um, any uh, concern about the the impact those um, uh, exploitation of those resources had on the people living in those on, on, in those communities and the African continent as a whole. So, so you can check maybe the expansion of this 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 surveillance capitalist uh, uh, companies on the African so, continent. I think to a large extent we can minimize the growth of this. Uh, uh, the rollout of this um, um, fourth industrial revolution into the African continent. Because if you look at China now, we don't see an expansion of Facebook or Google into the Chinese market. China has been, you know, strategic enough to keep, you know, a lot of these companies away from them. Um, so we want to see that we want to see emergence of our own indigenous tech companies that can compete effectively with them and check media expansion because we don't know, you know. These companies are capturing data and what they use this data for. Because these are the kind of challenges we're going to be facing as we move deeper into the 21st century. Oh, okay, Ego made the point earlier. Can, can you all hear me? Yep. You hear me? Okay. Okay. Ego, you made you made you made the point earlier that as I was asking a, a previous question, you made the point earlier that you know if uh, African countries were to more or less concentrate on improving existing infrastructure where say 4g jobs associated technology can be um cultivated with what we have now so that we still had you know modern technological infrastructure even though it wouldn't be as fast-paced as a ai centric uh thrust you said that the only way that that could basically work is if African countries basically shut shut themselves off. All right, I want to just provide a scenario for both of you all and then get your reaction. Suppose that AFTA offered African countries the opportunity as a, as a continent and block along with diaspora help and participation offered the opportunity and let's replace the word let's say shut off but let's say optimize its um internal and circulatory um productivity let's say after created the opportunity for africa to to do just that Suppose that African countries basically optimized after, and we were on a slower pace in comparison to the countries that tried to be AI centric, but within our ability to optimize our circulatory uh, systems through after with 4G, even though other countries might be trying to work with 5G, we figured out a way to basically advance within our own time frame, within our own pace, as we dealt with after, so that we could come up with um, technological advances that basically matched African problems with African solutions. So that in fact, we were able to advance within our own scheme without feeling that much of the heat we had to be ai centric or had to compete massively or that this ai centric structure um that would come upon us without us having a competing infrastructure would act as a new colonial dominance that we tried to repel that 
and basically operated within the sphere of ourselves and advanced along that pace. What, what do you think about that model as a way to move forward given after as a possible way of allowing us to internalize or to, to maximize our internal productivity? Uh, just, just when you say after, just for those who don't know, that's AFCFTA, that's African Continental Free Trade Agreement. <laughs> some, some people will know it as, as after. But, but um, I, I agree. I, I think uh, protectionism, my personal view and opinion, is is it's required, it's needed. I don't think the context of, of AFCFTA that, that they've created is is um, functioning or, or has an end goal of uh, protectionism in there. All what I hear uh, is just allow us to trade with ourselves, but it doesn't have anything that suggests that they are pulling back from the rest of the world and only focusing on ourselves. Maybe it's something they hope will be organic and and just happen naturally, and people would 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 start just trading with themselves and realize that they can rely on each other and are, are less reliant on the outside world. Uh, I'm not so sure. Um, I, 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 are, are you are you are you saying are you saying that you think that the current vision of of after uh, is one in which it's envisioned that if African countries trade with each other, they can compete globally. They can. Um, is, is that what you're saying? That you think that the mindset is that the idea is not for us to incubate ourselves so that we dictate the paradigm and narrative about how fast we move ahead, how we solve our own problems, uh, how we best match our economic uh, forecasts within a space and place that's comfortable for our movement but really it's about let's just trade within ourselves so that we get stronger so that we'll be able to race against China, race against the United States, race against the EU. Is that, was that what you feel like is, 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 it, is missing or short-sighted? Um, I, 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 just, I just haven't heard the plan. Um, I mean, right now, most countries are all trading. I mean, they're buying rice from China when they, they could grow the rice that's sufficient for their population at home. Or they go and they buy uh, chocolate from, from other people, where, whereas they should be processing the cocoa in, in, in Ghana and Ivory Coast, uh, or is it cashews or many other products. So um, people aren't buying from themselves because you know they never did uh, historically. Now they have an opportunity to. Um, the things that are being bought from the West are processed goods. So there's a lack of processing on, on the continent. So it's going to take some time to build up that capacity. But then when they do build up that capacity, I do envision that, yes, they would rather first hand buy uh, from their neighbor before buying first from someone from the West. But remember, uh, many countries are held captive because the leaders that are there uh, stooges and puppets of the West who would want to continue to have trade deals with the West because it, it further enhances their own interests because they have properties and investments in the West and it's not in their interest to see them lose any value from their properties and their interest uh, overseas. So it's all hinging on some of those people in government, those leaders, being kicked out for us to be able to fully trade only with ourselves. I also wanted to look at um, India would be a very fascinating country to look at because I think we, we all know what China's done. We all know, yes, the, the economic um, miracle over the past three decades. But this same question we're asking now about Africa, I think we can ask the same question in, in India. Because India is in a very kind of similar position. They are developing at a rapid pace, very large population, about 1 billion people. I don't know, are they are they adopting AI? And which, which is coming to our, our, our final um, question. Are they adopting AI right now as we speak at the same pace that was suggested? 
what 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 well um i i think that um they may they may be adopting aspects of ai they may think that they are adopting ai but they have their own models for for doing it and i want to i want to just hit this to both of you about a show that ego you and i had done on the um oc africa card we used that show to really talk about the to as a spinoff uh for, for africa to have for its diaspora something similar as a first step to the oic card which is overseas i'm sorry oci card which was the overseas citizen of india card and why India thought this was so great for its diaspora to have because India was not so much interested in necessarily having all of its diaspora people to come back to India to live as much as it was that they figured that there were so many Indian people that live as a diaspora who were doing so many things technologically until whatever India needed from the outside of India could be supplied to them by the technological exploits and positioning of many of their uh, you know, ex expatriates. So, so that in fact, India could dictate the pace at which they want to expand and if they need to expand in some areas, they would always be able to depend upon their diasporas to help them, such as, such as a, a company like Google, that is uh, the CEO is um, is East Indian. So in, in that regard, by having a technologically trained diaspora, as India does, India can direct its pace in AI, but slow down. And even if they cut themselves off or, or just, you know, got themselves uh, together in their own pace, if they needed new information that was AI centric, they could always depend upon their outside, their, their diaspora. So in that sense, would not Africa be in the same situation if, if the AFTA model was ramped up so that the circulatory and internal um, infrastructure and investment and trade would allow us to create our own sphere, so to speak. But because you have so many African peoples, such as us, that work outside of the continent, that the engagement from the continent's diaspora could be a valuable tool in helping to direct AI centricism, if you want, or AI directed projects in parallel and on pace with how it can be integrated into the continent's advancement as the continent sought to use its, um, its protectionism, so to speak, in these models to maximize what it already had without having to keep pace, but at the same time, when it needed to wrap up some things, it would already have knowledge from its diaspora about how to do it and how to plug it into an African sphere that would be on time with the infrastructure, the pace, the economy, and the sort of holes that need to be plugged in as we sort of move along. What, what, what do you, how, how would you all re react to that? Uh, I think I agree, Baruti. I think collaboration with it, with, with um, Africa's collaboration with its diaspora is definitely one of the ways where we can approach this this particular conundrum. Um, engagement with the diaspora, adoption of some of the skills that the diaspora has to offer, is definitely crucial to how we uh, we will approach this uh, this this particular challenge. Um, but but just to piggybacking on the um, on on India for a second. I think India has been quite strategic in how they, they position themselves. And as far back as the 90s, 
I know that India, India had been fortunate to have leadership that already saw the emergence of this fourth industrial revolution and the various components. So starting from the early 90s, India began to invest heavily in technologies, in new technologies, and the development of skills um, that would drive this new technology. So um, India has uh, a very, very top, um, 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 top um, um, tech schools that are even on par with um, some of the schools you even have in the West. I know about the Indian, uh, the Indian Institute of Technology in, um, in Chennai, uh, is it in Chennai or in, in New Delhi, that essentially serves as a farm where top students are literally handpicked by top US tech companies like Google, um, Facebook, or um, Oracle to either work in their offices in India or brought to the United States. Um, and uh, uh, we can see how that investment that India has been making in the 90s has begun to pay off. Now we can see in different tech companies uh, around the world, even, even in the West, you see Indians are very, very top leadership positions. You mentioned the head of Google, the current head of Google is of Indian descent, uh, even uh, Microsoft, even the current CEO of Microsoft is of Indian descent. And most of these um, Indian tech CEOs were not even born in the West. There were people who were educated in India, trained in India, they came, you know, obviously, immigrated to the, to the to the to the west at some at some point in their life because of their knowledge and so education it's, system and, 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 and education and, 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 and the vision that the leadership had at the time at that time so so the indian leadership was visionary enough to see this in the 90s i mean who was talking about ai who was talking about nobody was talking about artificial intelligence or, or program or advanced program or in, the, in the 90s but they were visionary enough so it's, so it's all about positioning yourself positioning your to take advantage of it but i i think we can learn from india not just being suppliers of manpower because i think what india is just doing just supplying manpower to the west to fill in all these gaps why i don't know how india in their own economy is benefiting from from this I think there are there are Indian tech, indigenous Indian tech companies that are now beginning to emerge. But in the last 10 years or thereabout, they were essentially exporting most of their skilled manpower to the West, um, uh, who then go and work from you know very top tech companies. So look, and we see how that's been paying off now because a, a significant amount of tech companies around the world seems to be dominated by by Indians in particular. Indians and and uh, other South Asian, uh, um, South Asian nationals. So um, obviously, this could have a significant effect because they could now come back with those skill sets and now begin to develop those indigenous tech companies in 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 their countries of birth. So oh, so you need oh, the oh, you you need diaspora. Yes, yes. And we, and just to mention, some of them have been going into into um, Africa. I mean. The, you know, they said there's something called a, the person who has the first African built phone. It's called a Mara phone. Mm -hmm. so it's in Africa, but I think the guy is Indian. Yes. You know, he is exactly. He's Indian. So, so yeah, they, they, they are good, they are first movers now, and this is a, the another uh, con with, with with AI, as in pros and cons. They are first movers, so they can easily easily come over and start to fill in the gaps on the continent mm -hmm. before we do. And that's a threat. This is another aspect of protectionism that our leaders need to take into account. Both China and India, but India in particular, because they're already there, they're closer. Um, they'll be used to the terrain because a lot of them have lived uh, on the east coast of Africa, uh, in, uh, in some in Kenya, some in Uganda, and in, in, in Mauritius as well. And those could be conduits to start bringing. They brought the first phone now uh, on the continent, right, as, as an African phone, but it's an Indian person and they can come and fill in those gaps. So we have a, a, a diaspora with skilled expertise in the West, in the US. India, India, even, has its own, India even has its own Silicon Valley in Bangalore. In Bangalore. They have its own Silicon Valley, but so they have quite a significant amount of um, indigenous Indian tech companies that are, that are now exactly. beginning to emerge from there and uh, you know become becoming increasingly competitive, yes. Um, yeah. Ego, the um, person you mentioned, and, and, and Namdi too, uh, the the person that you mentioned that's uh, the CEO of Mara. Yes. His name is uh, Ashish Thakar. 
and um, he is um, he's Indian. In fact, he's also uh, a Ugandan investor. Um, but you know, East Indian. So that makes the point that um, you know a diaspora of East Indians who who invest in the continent, living in places like Uganda, Kenya, some of the East African states, uh, Mauritius. Um, you know, are are, are positioning themselves to um, you know invest in in, in African countries. Um, so that that is true. Um, what would you what would you all say about? Um, okay, so let's say we've got a country like Rwanda again. I'm going to use an example with Rwanda in a different aspect. But as you all well know, that Rwanda in the past um, few years um, has some linkages with. Um, uh, MIT uh, and some uh, startup companies that deal with um, with drones. So uh, some of the drone technology is being used in Rwanda for the application of um, being able to um, deliver medicines to clinics that are in you know rural um, mountainous areas. It would be hard to get to, you know, by 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 truck or you know uh, that kind of thing. All right. So, what would you say about the use of that technology? Is is that the drone technology and AI technology in your in your view that is strategically used in that sense to solve a problem in Rwanda? of which um, it is not dismantling current infrastructure. It's not uh, really um, displacing employment, displacing workers, or uh, increasing the pace of an AI-centric thrust uh, so that it like sort of um, puts the country on a, a, on a trajectory that's too fast Force infrastructure is that is that the perfect type of AI that you think right now that can be used on the continent? Things to use AI to immediately solve problems without a um, dismantlement of current infrastructure and current um, you know assets. I think I think there's certain things that um, AI could um, service right now without um, intense job losses. There are certain things that AI is actually needed for desperately, especially in terms of things like healthcare. Um, there's not enough doctors um, and on the continent in general to serve the people. Most doctors, you know, there's this brain drain. A lot of them go work in the West, so. Artificial intelligence, AI or 5G could allow doctors work remotely and help with diagnoses uh, and referrals for people on the continent right now. That's something AI could do and help because there's a lack of them on the continent. So, right. when it, so in terms of healthcare, I think AI would be very welcome. Um, we're, we're talking about trying to help um, uh, um, um, create uh, uh, and, uh, more resistant crops uh, things like that, you know, uh, those those sorts of things. I, I think we can use artificial intelligence and and, and, and um, data data. Um, uh, deep that, data. Area is, that area has to do more with like biotechnology, advancements in biotechnology. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, genetic engineering, um, gene splicing. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I, I think those are the areas where we can see where um, um, where those kind of technologies, just newer technologies, can be applied. Um, for, for 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 crops that are a bit, a bit more resistant to antibi antibiotic resistant um, drugs, or, um, or or advancements in, in in genetic engineering to address some of the challenges that we're facing um, in the area of cancer research, or you know more advancements in more um, 
genetic diseases like um, Alzheimer's and stuff. So we can see applications or advancements in those kind of in technologies in those areas. Then in the area of um, medicine as well, we can see um, um, advancements in the area of digitalization of patient records. Um, we know that quite a lot of countries are beginning to roll that out, especially in the in, in the West, the digitalization of patient records, electronic patient record systems, the rollout of telemedicine that can enable you to um, um, essentially engage with your with your doctors remotely. You don't have to be there physically. I mean, these are some of the, the, the benefits of having um, uh, you know, the, the inter internet of things. Or even now, because I, I think this is going to be one of the features we're going to see as we move deeper into the, into the 21st century, the use of robots right. for complex medical surgery. So you don't actually have to have a, a doctor conducting very complex med medical procedure. You can have, begin to have like robots in the surgical rooms that will be conducting the surgery itself. Then uh, a doctor can be somewhere remotely, just right. controlling uh, so, the robots. So to minimize, you know, human error. So that's when you have a doctor now under, undergoing complex surgical operation for, you know, eight seven hours. Chances of human error is definitely high. Uh, so that's another area where we can see advancement of Internet of Things. So you're having multiple devices that are connected to the Internet and somebody controlling it remotely. So it's another component, again, of the uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, advancement of the, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. If, 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 even diagnosis, it's getting to a point where diagnosis, um, um, the, the data now, deep dive data, is able to diagnose more accurately and more efficiently than actual physical doctors when it comes to things like detection of cancer um, uh, and then the detection of tumors and things like that or from, from scans. They have machines or, or, or databases that can better detect that than, than in the human eye. So, that, so, that, so, that, so that, that's one area. That's one area Africa can benefit, in the, like in the area of healthcare, right. you know, telemedicine. So you can have a doctor who is um, in in Kansas, and he can have his, his patient can be in somewhere in Lesotho, you know, like a rural area in Lesotho, and in the, because of this new technology, you know, the doctor can the, the patient can still be able to have um, interaction with the doctor who's thousands of miles away. And still be able to provide that doctor with updates as to where she and, and the doctor can have access um, to the patient's um, um, uh, records electronically and be able to provide accurate diagnosis. So these are one of the ways that Africa can actually benefit from this so, uh, for, fourth industrial revolution. So in, in saying that, the final question is, is which is um, abort, uh, no, sorry, which is uh, adopt, delay, or abort. Uh, just give me your views and then and, and why why you think so um, in in one of those choices. I've, I've asked people on the um, on the chat room um, so far. It's it's been um, adopted. Um, so, someone said um, um, we we need to learn more about it before we adopt. Uh, there was a question for you actually, Namdi. Uh, before we get to that final question, it was um, uh, Cobb asked a question about uh, how you would compensate the loss of jobs with the new ones where all those machines will not be maintained. I, th I think I think we can we could we could train the people. What's not what we're doing now, but we just need to increase that pace because, like I mentioned earlier, there's definitely going to be job loss from this from 2020 to 2030. We will see a significant rise in unemployment mm -hmm. uh, as automation begins to take a significant chunk of these jobs, especially blue collar jobs, not just blue collar jobs but other areas because you know artificial intelligence in particular has a lot of applications. You know, it has the application in accounting because with the, with the use of artificial intelligence now, you don't actually need an accountant. You know, you can have there are now applications. You know, there are applications that you can that can do your accounting and do your taxes for you with artificial intelligence now. Even there are some instances now that you you don't actually need judges in 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 the courtroom. <laughs> you know, people are now looking at that. You know, uh, the introduction of robo judges. No robo judges. Seriously. Because they said that um, I think there was a research that was conducted that they said uh, that they noticed that during when it's about during midday or thereabouts, um, because of human error, I mean we are all mortals, that judges when they've not had their lunch, 
they tend to be very very edgy so if you are a um if you have a case in court and it's and it's the day you're supposed to be sentenced because the, the judge hasn't had his own lunch he might be a bit angry and instead of giving you 20 years can i give you 30 years <laughs> so, um, there's an element of human error so the, to minimize it near, near this human error some analysts are saying let's introduce robo judges and so if we use robo judges we can ensure that people can be getting fair and accurate judge uh, justices and also some are even going to the extent of saying robo judges could equally help to address um, um injustices or inequalities like in the united states so you have um some cases uh, where, bias or, or where you have where you have where you have bias where you have some judges that are that don't you know that tend to be a bit more biased to us you know or racial towards african americans or other ethnic minorities or in countries where you have you know a plurality of of ethnic groups so introducing machines or, or, or robots like that can play a crucial role in addressing all those areas so it has a lot of applications that we're beginning to see and and this can literally erode you know a platter of jobs so but how do we address this we there are, there are new jobs that are now beginning to emerge especially in and this is an, an area we've not talked about in renewable energy so renewable, renewable energy has uh um uh, uh, uh offers a, a, you know uh, an opportunity for for jobs there's a great number of jobs in those areas and uh, you know africa is definitely looking towards that direction in terms of the creation of jobs that it's looking at using for for its teaming youths um either in the area of hydropower electricity or um or, or wind wind and turbine so renewable energy offers an alternative to the declining uh to the to the to the to the, to the declining jobs that we'll be seeing that's artificial intelligence and other newer uh, technology would 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 take on on people as a whole on the continent my my my, my answer <clears throat> Um, ego to the question you, you last asked about when it came to AI, should Africa adopt, delay, or abort? My my answer is none none of the three. My answer is what I call SAA, which is to um, strategically adapt and apply, so that. In fact, you're going to take AI technology and adapt it where you need it and apply it to where it can best benefit. And so you're sort of like taking the AI and sort of um, using it to improve the infrastructure that you have instead of dismantling the complete infrastructure that you have uh, and replacing it. You're like using it as a tool for improvement onto what you already have. That's an interesting concept. So what if um because what if um, sorry go go ahead. I mean so I mean the examples that you gave with both of you gave with the uh you know with Madison, um, when it came as a tool to um, assist doctors in surgery, and uh, the example I gave about the use of the drone technology uh, in in supplying um, sending medicines from hospitals in Rwanda to um, mountainous uh, clinics. To me, that's an AI technology with the drone piece. If we looked at AI technology as being inclusive of vehicles that um, are autonomous, okay. So therefore, the drone would be piloted remotely. So that's an AI technology. But in either of those cases, which are medically related, in this case, it would still be an enhancement onto the infrastructure that's already there to solve specific problems. So why don't why wouldn't Africa look at it as a tool just for improvement 
not for you know a, a massive upheaval of what you already have when you can build upon what you have and keep it making improvements which which is technology i mean technology just simply means um improvement yeah yeah but but i think because there, there are it's why i would a bit disagree that it's not it is improving it but it's a different system because you're going from 4g to 5g you need completely different infrastructure so it it, it wouldn't be that you you could say you want to supplement so maybe cities major cities would have it and some other more remote rural areas won't or cities that have more manufacturing would have it and other places that have less manufacturing and more residential won't so you can have that sort of arrangement if you will um but because it's a different system different platform that that's why i asked it that way which is what uh, adopt it to be improving your system anyway but you have to create the structure and infrastructure for it to be a, to be utilized basically give give me an example where that wouldn't be the case i, I i'm saying that ai is is a lot of different technologies and i'm saying just use components of ai to help improve what you already have as opposed to a complete mass overhaul as though you're getting rid of all that you have. Just oh, I see. I guess. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess. Okay. Now, what well, would well, be the disadvantages in 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 going with that kind of um, idea? No. Because AI is a whole lot of different things. No, I, 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 I understand what you mean now, but uh, so so we, we're saying we're saying the same thing. When, when I said adopt, I meant it in in that way because I don't think even China has it. China doesn't have all their cities uh, set up with AI for sure. Uh, they, they don't. Though Shenzhen definitely would be. Uh, some places like Shanghai, a lot of them would, but some places as well wouldn't be yet. So um, and definitely the, the West is not yet. So. No, no, you see, you see, you see, I, I, I know, okay, I see, I see, I, I know what you were thinking of in terms of adopt. What, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm questioning is, is that, okay, like, if, if, for example, the fourth industrial revolution is dealing with the interface of technology and human lives, I, I realize that you you put in AI as as a like a subtopic underneath um, fourth industrial revolution. So I, I see AI as a, as a subset of that, if I'm correct. All right, what I'm saying is, to me, AI does not have to be solely. The, auto, the automation of everything that completely replaces humans. I'm saying someone can forecast or envision AI is doing that, but what if African countries in this case have their own view of what AI is and use AI, whatever we think various AI technologies are, to adopt them, as you say, but use them strategically so that AI for us does not mean complete automation, but it means a supplement of technologies that do involve automation that build upon the existing infrastructure that we have. And I guess in, only in certain industries that you need them for as well. So. It may only be so countries could say we don't want we, we don't want it in our financial or we may need it in our financial system and healthcare system, but not necessarily agriculture. Yeah. And right. agriculture, we still need it to be, you know, uh, our farmers running tractors for now because we're we have a larger population that are farmers in that industry that need to still um, make their livelihood and feed the economy that way because that's that's a major part or oil industry 
Yes. Um, we don't need to automate oil industry because of certain reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I agree. Okay, okay so uh, let me re rephrase the question then. So still sticking with the abort, excuse me, adopt, um, what was the second one I said? Adopt, delay, delay, delay or abort with, with, with whichever industry or whichever way you would say. So in answering that question, how would you answer it then? You said SAA, so okay, I, I, I could. Well, well, well. Now, well, now that you have, um, now that you provided some, some, uh, you know, alteration of what I think adopt means, um, then I would then say then adopt, but adopt it and use it as a tool strategically of how it best suits the upgrade in the society without a major uh, upheaval, but just improvement. So to me, as you've now said, adopt doesn't mean a wholesale swallowing where AI blankets everything, but adopt strategically where we can use it where we need it, how it best suits the improvement of the of the infrastructure. Okay, Namdi, <clears throat> what do you think? Oh, you're on mute, by the way. Well, yeah, I think I, I think I quite agree. I don't think that we should be in a hurry to ad, uh, adopt. Uh, okay, the, get into the fourth industrial revolution like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't think we should be quick to adopt. I think that there's still uh, perhaps because it's still in the early phases. There's still a lot of unanswered questions. Um, for example, let me give you a typical example, like in the area of um, biotechnology. Mm -hmm. So we begin to see um, a democratization of technology um, and it's, it's opening up um, um, new frontiers of science that um, we currently do not really have answers to. Answers to. For example, now we begin to see in the area of gene splicing and people taking up and people just people who are even not scientists. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about this. Is this, this Spicer or what, what do you call that thing? Is this space uh, CRISPR, uh, CRISPR technology? You know, people who are not even scientists who are just taking out um, certain segments of, 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 um, of cells or of DNA and using it for various you know, um, scientific experiments. Somebody even as going as far as even selling it on the internet. So there are, there are, there are ethical issues. There are ethical issues, um, scientifically and ethical issues that are, that, that are still not been addressed. And that also that needs to be finalized on the, where the boundaries will be in, in, a, in a complex area like, like biotechnology. Like for example, in the area of, um, um, Antibiotic, antibiotic resistant drugs. Um, we hear that they are, they are developing um, um, a prototype for a mosquito that is um, that can attack that can attack uh, other mosquitoes that are that that carries the the the, 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 the malaria the malaria symptoms. You know, so so there there are there are. You know, different kind of genetic experiments that are going up in various laboratories that uh, do not have any kind of ethical backing. That I fear that could have you know wider implication if uh, if they are not checkmated. I mean, we saw this in, the, in during the Cold War, where we saw countries that are like the, especially the United States and the Soviet Union developing biological weapons and uh, incorporating them in, into ballistic missiles. So we can see also in this new fourth industrial revolution, we can see um, people who are actually going to the laboratory and developing and coming up with all kinds of weird um, products that can be used as offensive and as defensive weapons. So there's still a little gray area in that area. And then the area of autonomous uh, vehicles and autonomous weapons, I think we'll even talk about that. There are autonomous weapons that are coming up now. I know that there is a, there is a, there is a company in Boston 
that is developing like autonomous robots that are being used that the US military is now you know considering deploying in in you know in in, in the theater of war that could um, essentially um be used in 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 in, in, in war in, in you know in war i mean i think we've even seen them test run some of them in in um, in live sh shooting environments where they send a robot out to a, a press, an individual's door and the individual and the robots can essentially act as a uh, as a mediator between the the, the police and uh, like a would-be robot or something like that so there's you know there's still a lot of questions around where it's, where where do we draw the line in terms of autonomous autonomous cars or autonomous machines or autonomous robots can they be deployed into warfare does, does doesn't that change the rules of engagement for warfare right you know um and also in the area of cyber crime i mean we've seen the us and china now engage in um uh, back to back account, uh, attacks cyber attacks I and mean, the us claim that china is hacking into their system Chinese are equally claiming the same thing and there is no kind of you know kind of treaty there currently does not exist any kind of treaty that can mandate what a country can and cannot do and i think that um whether we like it or not um hacking and cyber security uh, will play a crucial role in the coming in the coming years as systems become increasingly complicated and becoming increasingly interconnected with the internet they will become increasingly vulnerable to to to, to hacks so uh, there has to be some kind of like um, um, treaty or laws that that should be introduced that can stimulate can, that can stipulate what countries or organization can and cannot do. You know, there's a there's a country now, for example, uh, that has you know uh, sophisticated hackers. Do they have the right to go into another country's website and steal national security sensitive national security documents? simply because they can get away with it just like the u.s claim that some chinese hackers are doing or some chinese hackers claim that the u.s is doing to them can that go on what are the implications those kind of attacks have on the economy so there's a lot of questions you know there's a lot of questions <coughs> a great number of authors have been you know talking about this i know um uh, uh what's his name again harry kissinger in the, one of his most recent book, The World Order, talked about this as well, and was beginning, and, and he was one of those who advocated for there to be some kind of treaty between nations that essentially stipulates what they what they can and cannot do, how they essentially use these instruments or weapons of the fourth industrial revolution on each other. There has to be some kind of agreement on how it's going to be used. So is it just going to be open season? Anybody who has an ability to do this and cause harm to another country simply because they have the technology they can do it and inflict as much damage as they can or does it mean that a country that has because they have uh, a more advanced technology they can simply deploy autonomous autonomous machines into the theaters of war and simply because of that the country that they are fighting with does not have autonomous weapons so they cannot fight them you know there has to be some kind of agreement on how you know countries that have this advantage use this over countries that do not have uh this this advantage i guess it's very it sounds very egalitarian but um we are pushing for a more egalitarian society where people who essentially have an edge do not use their their size to dominate those who are, who are essentially weaker so there's still a lot of unanswered questions and i wouldn't want us to jump into an area that is still relatively very new and gray so i think we should focus on developing our own technology you know, focus on developing our technology and try as much as possible to keep out, you know, of all these um, tech companies that are beginning to emerge, multi-trillion dollar tech companies like the like the Googles and the um, the, the Facebooks and, uh, uh, and, and, and the Amazons as far as possible and focus on developing our own technology, focus on trading on ourselves and to begin to understand how this new, this new revolution the impact it will take and how countries essentially agree on what the modus operandi will be. Okay, I, I okay, uh, Nandi, I, I agree. I agree in principle with what you were basically saying. We got to 
you know, with regard to whatever technology is uh, undertaken, we have to draw lines and boundaries and, you know, make make proper assessments, um, you know, about the, the moral implications of, of, of the actions. But I wanted to just say, um, e Ego, that I, I, I may have sort of misanswered your question because I, 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 I missed the question. Did, did you ask um, whether we should um, adopt, delay, or abort AI, or or was it um, fourth um, fourth industrial revolution? Um, well, in a way, they, they are they are a bit a bit one, one of the same. The, 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 the fourth what, industrial what revolution, revolution in saying in saying the mass adoption of of artificial intelligence in our. Uh, in, in our economies, yeah, yeah but you know. okay, do you you asked that question, right? Yes. Oh, okay, so you you asked the question: Should you adopt, delay, or abort AI, right, in our economies? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now that now that's what I was answering, and I thought I may have misread the question. Based on what Namdi's response was, but Namdi was Namdi seemed to be answering: Should you adopt, abort, delay when it came to um, you know for um, you know fourth industrial revolution, which I I think these are different different kinds of things. I think that AI is a, is a, is a sub-branch of the fourth industrial revolution. I think that 5G is a sub-branch concept under that, underneath that. But to me, the fourth industrial revolution deals with the, um, the, the further integration of technology and in, uh, the interface and engagement of technology and human lives. So, so in that regard, yes, I'm okay with, with fourth um, industrial revolution. Yes, if it means that, but I'm still for drawing lines and boundaries and adapting it where needed you know, into the economy, into the life or, or, or whatnot. But at the same time, if we were to look at a sub-branch of AI, I would still say that we need to adopt strategically so that we always are in a position to question the morality of certain things, to question whether an economy is going to be obliterated or not, to look at the human impact, to look at the impact on the societies, and to draw lines, boundaries, critiques, and strategies about how we're going to implement any of these ideas, whether it's um, 5G, whether it's AI, or whether on the larger uh, end, something dealing with um, fourth industrial revolution. But I just wanted to make sure that I got the, the, the question right, but I do see the fourth generation um, of the fourth uh, industrial revolution as being the um, the set, and these other things are, are, are subsets completely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, my my <clears throat> my take. I haven't heard it or what you've all said. I. I. The benefits. I only see right now, uh, and my preference for the way our economy should be. I I, I want us to trade with with ourselves. I want us to be protectionist. I want us to break away from the globalization and the globalized economy, um, and 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 the mass adoption of of um, those systems. I think will stunt us right now. Um, I only want the 
healthcare benefits um, and not mass adoption of it. If, if I, I prefer that we develop our own systems, we develop our own um, artificial intelligence systems, develop our own uh, 5G in time and let it be on our own platforms. Um, because we see that the divergence between USA and China and the platforms that they're creating, they're not aligning in their global system. Chinese are having their own platforms, their, their technological platforms being very distinct. In fact, I think they're trying to have their own internet. Uh, China is planning to have their own internet very, very soon, <laughs> completely separate from the US. And, I, I, and then, uh, we, have, we have people in Africa who I think are going to be saying, who are we going to go with? Who's going to give be our server? I don't think we should align with any of them. I think we should have our own. <laughs> I think everyone should go back to their protectionist ways. And because globalization hasn't worked, we see, at, at, we see at Davos now, they're trying to rehash the new capitalist system. They, they've come up with something called stakeholder capitalism, which is, <laughs> which is, which is another word for like, we want to keep capitalism going, but we're going to give you all some crumbs <laughs> now. That, 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 that's, that's what they've got going on. But, but essentially, it's the same thing. So I personally am tired of globalization and the globalized economy. I think it's time for Africa to pull back internet systems, financial systems, economies, pull back, sell to each other. Oh, we definitely need healthcare. We don't have enough doctors. So have a program to bring the doctors that we do have outside back train aggressively and then for the shortfall we have then you can have telemedicine and and, and uh you, you use technology to have doctors serve your people there but i don't want mass adoption i think we, we need to grow we can't skip every step in in a, in a in a in a nation or a people's development i don't think we should skip steps um, um skipping so many steps i mean it's good to leapfrog when you leapfrog so many then certain skills are lost certain skills are never passed down and then you find yourself constantly needing as we have now with china needing china if something breaks down we're going to call chinese people to come and fix it because they built a lot of the infrastructure we have now anyway right so skills transfer is not as pervasive as it, it, it can be so i don't want us to skip that step because that's the final step once we build the infrastructure we're going to be like europe who can't undo it so I think we need to build it now. I think we need to build it. You know, population is growing. We should just build it now, get the help where we do need it, but we need to build it. We need to pull back. And that, that's, that's where I stand on it. Oh, okay, but see, yeah, but ego, I, I, okay, I agree. I, okay, I agree. Um, but what, 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 what you're saying is we have enough knowledge and intelligence to basically take what we already know and build upon it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It, but, but the answer that you gave to the question that you provided Namdi and I with abort, delay, you know, or adopt um, the AI uh, kind of thrust to me was different than the, the kind of way in which you kind of asked that question in the way that you responded. Oh, you, I see. You, oh, well, well, let me, let, let me answer it then. Okay, but, well, I, I'm saying I agree. I agree with what you with what you what you said, but you you sort of um, asked Namdi and I a different question than the way that you 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 answered it. Yeah. Okay. So so let, let, let me answer that way. Yeah. I just well I, I just got into thinking. So um, would I adopt? No. Um, so I think I'm more of um, a board. Well, no, but but no, but I'm, 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 really I'm, I'm, I'm a board because because we 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 cannot we cannot um, we we don't have it right now. If we're going to 
adopting, would have been adopting um, Western technology. Delay, uh, it could be delayed because we're delaying before we create ours. Yes, you could say it that way. Okay. But um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pull back from the system right now. So no, but you way, don't that though. No, what? I'm saying you believe it, but when, okay, okay, wait, wait, wait a minute. Let me let's see if I can get what you say. No, see you. Okay, it, you you're saying um, you're saying abort. All right, as in. Okay, you don't want. So, so to. It's, it, it's it's between delay and abort, no, which but, isn't really the answer, no, I guess. Directly, don't believe, I, I I'm I'm gonna prove to you that you don't believe that it. it you're saying it, but I'm not sure that you. Uh, I'm not sure that you mean it. And here's what I mean. Okay, if I said that the drone technology is being used to send needed medicines from, say a hospital in Kigali to a remote area in Rwanda uh, to, to, to a clinic in a, in a mountainous remote area. Do, do you agree with that? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Now, that that is using AI technology. Not necessarily. It is because, because, because a drone is an autonomous vehicle that has been programmed to fly from different coordinates. So to me, if you agree with that, it doesn't mean that you've aborted AI technology. It doesn't mean that you have aborted means I'm not gonna use it. It doesn't mean that you delayed using it because you will be using it. Uh, what was that delay a boy and and it and and it could mean adopt if you if you mean adopt as in like strategically <coughs> phase in what you, what you need it seems like within all of that you're saying let's use what we need and keep moving as opposed to a wholesale either adoption, a wholesale delay, or a complete aborting. Seems like you want to use it as a tool where needed. Yeah. Okay, so you've you've not you you've adopted it, but you've strategically made it a tool. So when you okay. say I want to pull back and I don't want to use it at all. Using the drone situation is using some of AI. It's but, just but, that you're not, but it's it's just that you are you're making supplements as we sort of create our own paradigm to move forward. You can always use things as useful tools, not a wholesale absorption. Okay, you're right. It's more of a delay for me then. It's more of a delay than 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 adopt. It's more of a delay. The the, 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 the drone the drone one the, the, the drone the drones have existed, you know, for for quite some time now in four G. Remember, um, the fourth industrial revolution is mainly about five G. It's mainly about the Internet of Things. The, a drone is not necessarily a, an autonomous vehicle. Uh, people still control it. You have a controller. Uh, I mean, there's GPS coordinates, but that's not that's not necessarily. Part of the fourth industrial revolution that's 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 existed um even even um as, as far back as you know beginning of the decade if, if not even before so i I, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily call the current drone technology which is just mounting some medicine and sending it to a remote area as as the part of the main mainstay or main characteristics of the fourth industrial revolution the fourth industrial revolution is far more um uh, extensive than that far more extensive and, and and the applications uh currently don't exist i'd say on the continent i don't, I don't think they exist in, in usage right now oh i see so yeah. the drone technology in your view is not is not really part of the fourth industrial revolution not not the current drones we have now no when when um amazon 
have their drones up, which would be mm -hmm. just that, that that would be basically linking so the, the drone would be able to pick up your parcel, link to your account, yeah. know when you need something, when you need it replenished, when you've run out of all your stuff in your fridge, it okay. signals to your Amazon account and that you have a, your account registered with your card. It gets picked up and it comes straight to you like that without you doing a thing. It knows, like it learns, it knows. That's 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 when it's different. I see. That's so remote it. programming. So remote programming is not artificial. Is not artificial intelligence. No, it, it is artificial intelligence. Well, maybe it's not. I mean, I mean, if you if, if you if you're pro, I mean. If you are remotely controlling something, hold on. Let me let me let me get the, the. That may not be AI. No, the AI, AI is the simplest form. AI simply means it's sometimes called machine intelligence. It's intelligence uh, demonstrated by machines. Hold on, let me just get a, a typical uh, definition. Uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. It used to describe um, machines or computers that mimic cognitive functions that humans associate with the human mind, such as learning and problem solving. So that that's artificial intelligence. But when, when we're talking about what 5G can do is way more, uh, way more advanced than that. So Artificial intelligence is like, you know, playing chess. You're playing a video game, and the game is trying to beat you, you're trying to beat the game. Okay. So, yeah, that, that's that's artificial intelligence. Then it's, it's it's also learning uh how you play sometimes and it can be able to beat you back because it learns about how you play and your style and it understands and it gets better. So okay. it's machine learning. That's machine learning. Okay. Um but just programming something to go from A to B. Because if you send that drone, the drone is not going to know to stop um, if a bird is flying close to it. It's not gonna change course. You know, it won't have sensors uh, to be able to uh, be able to monitor its environment, which is different from the Tesla vehicles. Right. So the Tesla vehicles now know what's in front of it, know what's coming around, know which area is about to go, can stay online. They have, they, they're gaining information, right. much more information than you would ever get in a drone. So that, that's why I don't, uh, Oh, Look okay. at the drone as being, you know, part of the fourth industrial revolution, or, or, no, or no, that no, no, sort see, of five no, G vehicle. No, see, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. That and Tesla, know, Tesla is quite it's autonomous too, right? It, Tesla is autonomous, but a drone, a drone is really autonomous. You, you, you can just set it. Wait, wait a minute, I'm saying to you that the fourth industrial revolution involves different aspects that. Artificial intelligence is one component of the fourth industrial revolution. Wearable and implantable healthcare sensors, as I mentioned about earlier about blood pressure, the hip replacement from a 3D printed bone, a bionic arm, drones delivering medicine, all of these are parts of the fourth industrial revolution. That these are all aspects, even though they can be different. So as you explain artificial intelligence, let's say artificial intelligence is different than the technology for drones. I'm saying that both of them are listed under the industrial revolution because as people debate what they think the, industri the fourth industrial revolution is versus the third one, is they seem to think that the third, the fourth one is simply more of a focus on the interface of technology and human lives. Yes, uh, that's correct. Right, but drones and AI, though not the same, are still components of the fourth industrial revolution. <laughs> that that that's what the yes, yeah. drones drones and AI Ali drones will come into the in the area of autonomous autonomous, right. autonomous machines. 
the right. GI, GI the fourth generation, the fourth revolution. Yes. So drones will come into the in the area where you have autonomous autonomous cars, autonomous vehicles. Because the drones itself is remotely controlled. It's controlled remotely. Okay. Then for the AI, the AI itself is an application or a solution. AI, yeah, right. they're all a solution that mimics human functions. Okay. So, so listen, I'm just laughing. Someone just, someone just uh, put a comment. It says um, this channel is not for emotionally laden people. <laughs> this channel is for people with logic and strategy. <laughs> Thank you. But <laughs> emotionally laden people, <laughs> that was quite quite funny. <laughs> so I just want to read that out. <laughs> okay. but, 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 but I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the fourth, the fourth industrial revolution seems like it has a number of components and, and some of which ego, maybe you think that we can use and others you think that we should abort. So that, there are aspects, I mean, that you might feel like are good and there are aspects that we shouldn't have. So it's not a rejection of the fourth industrial revolution completely. It's that we're strategic about what aspects we think are, are useful as, as tools. So at the same time, you would think that the drone technology, when I mentioned about the, the medicine, which can come under autonomous vehicles is good in the Rwanda sense and maybe some other senses. At the same time, you may pull back on various applications of AI. And then if someone were to ask you, well, do you believe that um, we should abort, um, delay or adopt um, the fourth industrial revolution, you may not be able to give just a black and white answer on all three of those because if you say, I think that I'm okay with the adoption of the uh, drone technology, someone says, okay, that's under fourth industrial revolution. I'm okay, Namdi, with... Um, using, um, you know, robots to help medical doctors in surgery. But then at the same time, there are other aspects of the fourth um, industrial revolution that might be in the AI sector or some others that you say, hey, look, I think we need to um, just abort it. And then there's some aspects that you might say, well, for now, delay it, perhaps with a future infusion. So maybe it's not black and white on all three, but we have to strategically look to do one of the three at different times to make it work. Given that fourth generation, fourth re industrial revolution is not just is not just one thing. Yeah, I agree. You're right. I, I think um, we can't just let phrases and uh, definitions, by the way, these are just man-made terms that were created by someone only a few years ago um, to just pigeonhole uh, strategy. So, yeah, I agree. It's um, Strategy is the whole game. Strategically apply it where needed and um, don't use um, or, 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 or prevent using those which would harm your economy, but you, that takes long-term strategy and thinking, uh, as well as uh, in-depth analysis and projection over time, and collaboration with your partners, neighbors, uh, regional groups, and continent at large, uh, with the focus of a long-term um, aim of, 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 of dominance, looking down hundreds of years, even to a thousand years. Um, so I, I agree. So I think, um, yeah, that's been um, <clears throat> this. This is this is a topic that I, I feel very strongly about. Um, there's not much in-depth discussion about such topics um, on the continent anywhere. You you, you search, you don't find anyone talking about this. It's as if the, everyone's pre 
pre preoccupied with the here and now, the the, the, the usual conversation about uh, security, jobs, politics, but no one's ever projecting into the future. That's what we like to do: talk about future, think, strategize, um, analyze, and just try to look at Africa through a world world's eye view. And uh, I hope you managed to do that today. So for all those who participated, who left your comments, thank you for your comments. We really, really enjoyed them. Uh, thank you for participating. Do come back, share, like, subscribe. Uh, and we'll hopefully, and, and also give suggestions of what you'd like to hear us talk about um, uh, in the future. And uh, we should come back with something very soon in a couple of days. So. Hang, hang on one second before, before you go. I, I I still wish the um the listening audience had uh, been able to see how we how we debated the format and potential slant of the of, of the show just so that people would get a, a flavor that there's such a topic like this which is very um intriguing could take all types of um, angles and all types of, um, you know, dynamics that, that you know, would happen. Um, and having said that, I, um, I, I, I picked out a little proverb that I thought could possibly work with the show, but I, I just want to get your reaction to it. Um, the end of the journey is reached by moving ahead. It's um, an Ovambo proverb of peoples that are from um, Angola and Namibia. But is that is that true? The end of the journey is reached by moving ahead. I mean, do we ever reach the end of the journey? I mean, can we just say that it's that it's reached by by sort of moving ahead? Where we can reflect and say, okay, we bypassed something. We've improved something, or is there another context to that to that proverb? I'd, I'd like to get you all's reaction. So I'll say the proverb again and see what you think. The end of the journey is reached by moving ahead. What, what do you all think of that? Well, to me, that sounds like um, you just have to keep moving. Um, rather than pontificating about where, where you want to go, sometimes you just have to keep moving, moving ahead, and uh, then you get there. And obviously dealing with um, all the issues along the way. Um, in, in, this, in this case, uh, not waiting for global powers to dictate how um, you are going to determine your own strategy. You, you move ahead and you think for yourself. You think, uh, we think as Africans individually and make our plans based on that, not just based on global practices and everyone saying uh, this is the way we're going, world order, uh, everyone running helter-skelter for global warming or whatever. You know, We decide what's going to suit us, looking towards the end, looking down the road and make plans for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Nandi, you got a, a thought? I think you, you have summarized everything already. Taking the words from my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, thank you all very much. I hope you have a good evening. See you later. Go ahead. Hey, 